Good morning, everyone. Three months ago, we were here. Three months ago. It's been a long three months, and I'm glad to come out to worship the Lord and be together to fellowship. And um, to just, I know it's everything is different for us, yet uh, God is in the midst of us, and we celebrate that he is here. And of course, we have another service at 11 o'clock, so uh, we're looking forward to that. It's kind of like, it is not a split church, just saying that, just so you all know that. Well, I do want to go through a few announcements right at the beginning of the service. Um, they are important because we want to, of course, follow the New Brunswick laws and the restrictions that we have. So um, we are following all of the social distancing laws, and I'm glad that you were able to do that this morning. Um, just a reminder, make sure you use a hand sanitizer when you walk in. It's in the foyer. There's another uh, dispenser in the second foyer. So on your way out, if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to use it. And a reminder, if you're sick, don't come. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have promoted this as a touchless service. Just make sure, making you feel comfortable that you can walk into this church building without having to open up a door, without having to touch a piece of paper. You notice we're not handing out bulletins. We're sending out our weekly, now our weekly newsletter. So you can uh, catch up on what's happening in the church through the newsletter. So um, we're, uh, and I just want to say, you know what, you're safer walking in here than you are in the grocery store or in the bank or, you know, if you walk in the bank and they've got the mask on, I don't know, it's kind of a dangerous feeling there, I guess. Anyway, uh, we are certainly having our staggered uh, seating, so I encourage you to see where the crosses are and sit there. And uh, we are going to be wiping off all the seats in between the services, so you'll be, anyone coming in will be safe for that. Um, after the service today, we are going to, I'm just going to ask you, instead of us all walking out we, like we normally would, just to kind of one section at a time, so we'll start with this section when we're finished, this section you can use both doors and over there while you're on your own. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're just going to ask you to just walk out and keep your social distancing as you walk through. Now you'll notice that you were given a communion cup when you walked in. Now this is a little different for us. And I'm going to show you how to do this so when Dr. McMillan leads us in a little few moments with, in the communion service, we'll all know how to, I know it sounds strange, but there are two, two ways to get in this. The first top is the, cu the, the clear and the purple level. You take that off first and that will give you the little piece of bread, okay? And then the tin foil piece is the part where you open up the cup. All right, so then, and after you're finished, if you would put it back into the plastic cup, and we'll collect them after the service. Um, I think uh, everything else, I think, pretty well self-explanatory, but if you have any questions, don't uh, be afraid to ask. We certainly want you to feel comfortable and know that while you're being safe, you're also in the presence of God and among friends, so we're glad to be here. Uh, as we as we start this service, I just another few announcements. I mentioned the newsletter, and um, I want to encourage you to see what's in that, see what's happening in the church, and if you have any announcements, would you forward them on to Brianne Perry? Uh, there is a couple of other announcements that were in the one was in the newsletter. Ruby Milbury's niece, um, her great niece, uh, we are collecting for her. So if you would like, she had, there was a fire in their home last week. So Liz Wall, our outreach director, is going to be, uh, if you have any money and you want to give it to her for this cause, please do so. We'll be purchasing gift cards for the family. And I did have a prayer request um, from Joyce Carr. Joyce Carr's nephew was in a car accident with one of their friends, Marjorie Henry and Philip LeBlanc. Philip is the car's nephew. And they were in a car accident on Friday, and they're both in, both in intensive care. So I'd like to remember them in prayer as we begin the service. Well, I have um, Psalm 100 I want to read. This is one of the lectionary readings for today. So Psalm 100. Would you stand as we read the word? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. We've come to worship you. Lord, I just pray that as we begin this service, that our eyes, our focus would be on you, on who you are and what you want to say to your people. We thank you, Lord, that we can bring any need that's on our hearts and, and just on our spirits today. And we lift up to you this morning, Marjorie and Philip, and ask, Lord, for your hand on their lives and that you would help them to heal quickly and fully. I ask, Lord, that you'd bless them and just give the doctors and wisdom and nurses wisdom and um, as they help them with their, their care in this hospital. So, Lord, we ask for their protection. We think of those in the hospital that are in our congregation. Think of Clarence Bannister and Roy Gillies. Lord, keep your hand upon them. Bless them. Encourage them. Be with their families. And now, Lord, we've come to worship you, and we ask, Lord, that in, in these moments as we we sing, we say whatever is on our hearts, Lord. We ask that you will hear what's in our hearts, the worship that's in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you that we have an opportunity, opportunity to do that today. May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, love of the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Fail my 
My song will rise, my song will rise to you. Well, there's strength in my lungs. I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, in the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in my worship him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you.
may be seated. We'll continue in worship with Dr. McMillan leading us. Thank you, Pastor Patty. Uh, a real delight to be together today. After these many weeks of isolation, think of you, pray for you uh, repeatedly. Uh, your faces come to mind as uh, I pray. But to actually be here together, <laughs> it's a real delight. In anticipating this service, I couldn't help but think of the very first time we had communion in this room. Like the very first time. Almost 35 years ago. Most of you are too younger to remember 35 years ago. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a very significant day in the life of our congregation. Because in most senses, when we share communion, we really get to the heart of what the gospel is all about. In one sense, it's a time of reminiscing. To look back, I picture some of the people who were here uh, 34 and a half years ago who are in heaven now. I picture some people that were here, Eddie and Edna Harrison. You didn't know them, some of you did, but uh, that'd be Patty's mother and father. Um, other people come to mind. And when we met that Sunday morning, we'd been worshiping in the basement here. When we arrived on the scene, uh, this was a hole in the ground. <laughs> And uh, the building developed uh, somewhat gradually uh, following that. But the first time we met in this room, uh, we shared communion uh, as a, a way of looking back on the ways that God had chosen to bless us as a congregation. The congregation was uh, small at that time, not quite as few as you are here today. But we had reason to rejoice, reason to be thankful for, for God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Uh, communion is partly about that. Jesus said the night that he first gave bread to his disciples and said, eat this in remembrance of me, uh, he made reference to the fact that they were celebrating an event uh, that at that time among their people had been celebrated for hundreds of years. It was a remembering, remembrance of their last supper in Egypt when they were in captivity. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. And so we come to remember him. But it also is uh, more than a memory. It's a, a celebration of now. Uh, that feels particularly significant when it's so long since we've been together in our physical presence. It's one thing to interact with images. Images on screens. Pastor Patty, thank you for, for your messages uh, on the screen <laughs> and in our ears. But to actually be together in the same room, there's something about here and now uh, that is so significant. I uh, recall when the writer of the Hebrews was beginning his letter. He said, you know, God has spoken to us many times in the past by means of prophets, by means of video and audio, <laughs> if you want. But in these recent days, he has actually come among us in the presence of his son, Jesus and the writer to the book of Hebrews added, you knew him, you met him, you saw him in the flesh. And there's something about that that we, we recollect vividly here today as we're actually together once again after these many, many weeks. But there's a third thing about it. And Jesus said to them, as often as you do this, 
I want you to remember that this isn't the end, that there's something better coming, that the day will come when we're all called from our places in the world, the places around the world, and we'll be invited to sit down with Jesus himself physically. Uh, we celebrate the ministry of the Spirit, but we also recognize that good as that is, there's something about being in the actual presence that is promised, the tangible presence of Jesus on that day when uh, time has finished and eternity is rolling. He said, as often as you take this communion, think of the past, think of this moment, but also think of the future when all of the broken relationships of the past will be healed, when all of the sorrow, the sadness, the disappointment, the regret that comes so vividly to us in the dark night of loneliness. But the day will come when that's put away and all relationships will be healed and God himself will be tangibly among us. We're trying to do that together in communion. You received something like this. My fingers aren't as nimble as they used to be. <laughs> 35 years ago, this would have been a piece of cake. <laughs> but there is some bread in here, I believe. Would you open it? The scripture says that Jesus, when he had supper with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and gave thanks. Take the bread that has been provided for us. Eat it and be thankful for who Jesus is. Amen. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to each of them and said, as often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Drink this cup in memory, in thanksgiving, and in anticipation of what God has yet in store for his people. Amen. Shall we pray? We are thankful, Lord, for your provision. For, thank you for the healing power of your presence. Thank you for these, your people, who are gathered here. May this bread and this wine be a nourishment for our bodies but also for our spirits. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jake's going to lead us in a song. You're just, you're, if you'd like to remain seated, that's great. I search the world
team for helping out and they're going to do double duty today of course because we're going to be singing and leading the worship in the second service so I'm working them hard today so uh, but I also want to thank Dr. McMillan for leading us um, in communion uh, most of you know that he was also my pastor so I there's um, there's something so wonderful for me to see him as our pastor emeritus just participate in all our services and lead us again so thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I love, uh, I read recently N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar. I don't know if any of you read any of his books, but he wrote one time, um, just for, I guess he was, he was writing about how Jesus fully wanted to fully explain uh, his forthcoming death and what it was all about. And so he, he, I, it's neat that he didn't give them a theory. He didn't give them a, a series of scriptural texts to look at. Jesus gave them a meal, and that's what we have participated in today. He gave us a meal, and I, I believe that we have all here been already tasting and seeing that the Lord, he is good. Well, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I've been sitting at my desk, looking into my uh, monitor, and speaking to you. 
So today it is, I'm, I, you know what, I really love this thing, you know, this big old thing up here. I'm just thankful that I'm able to be here and to open the word of God and for us to look at what he has for us in this moment. Well, if you've been following along, and I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands or anything like that, but if you've been following along, you'll see that uh, I've been preaching uh, the I am statements, the seven I am statements of Jesus. And uh, of course, we had the first one, which was the bread of life. And I just love how Jesus took advantage of the moment that he was in, when, because he talked about being the bread of life in the midst of the Passover, in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the spring. And then we learned about Jesus, how he said, I am the light of the world. And he said that during the Festival of Tabernacles, a festival, it's in the fall, the Festival of Booths. And that's during this same kind of length of a festival where every evening of the festival, there would be these tall uh, post poles that would be put up in the city of Jerusalem. And everyone from miles around could see these lit lights all across the city of Jerusalem. But on the last day of the feast, they weren't lit. And that's when Jesus stood up and to the crowd said, I am the light of the world. You don't need these menorahs. You need me. I'm the light of the world. Last week, and this week and last week kind of go together. For he said, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the way in. I'm the way out. I am the way. And uh, this week, closely connected to it, because we have the sheep and the shepherd, he says, I am the good shepherd. Now, it could have been during the Festival of Tabernacles, but likely it was during the Festival of Dedication, which was the winter festival, and it was what we call Hanukkah, a lot of us Festival of Lights Hanukkah. And um, in that day, and in that festival, interestingly enough, um, Jesus or I should say the, the, the people would celebrate this festival by bringing out the scriptures, rereading the book of Ezekiel, specifically the chapter 34, where um, God says to the people, I will be Israel's shepherd. And, there's, and they would read it, and it was kind of like a rededication of the priestly um, calling, and they would, that would be done in this festival. And here is Jesus, and in this setting, Jesus says... I am the good shepherd, claims to who he was. So um, as we get, begin, we're again in the book of John. So the words are going to, oh, by the way, you may have noticed my sermon title, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and no, we're not going to talk about that 1966 movie, Clint Eastwood's movie, we're not going to do that. Um, but I just kind of liked the title, so I'm using it today for the sermon. So John chapter 10, if you want to follow along, you're welcome to follow along on the screen or use your own Bibles. And I am going for, through for the first 10 verses that we did look at last week, because as I said, it's so connected. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was talking, telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Though they, they will come in and go out and find pasture, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I love that, that line. And verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen, I must bring them also. 
they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is a demon-possessed and raving man. Why mad? Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And of course, remember that happened. He did open the eyes of the blind man uh, previously. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, of course, we are looking at um, Jesus as the good shepherd, and he's reminding them and the people of God and people that are listening, those who are against him and others that were with him. Um, he reminds them that God is often described in the Old Testament as being the shepherd of Israel. Just to give you a few examples of that, you can look them up in another time, but Genesis 49, verse 24, when Jacob had gathered all of his sons around, his 12 sons, and wanted to bless them before he died, he had these words for Joseph. But his bow remained steady, his strong arms stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. Because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you. So there's a definite reference to God being the shepherd. Uh, of course, the, the beloved psalm that uh, we know so well and the people that were listening to Jesus that day knew so well. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23, I shall not want, Psalm of David. So we're going to uh, look at a few things. The good, there we get the good part out here. So what defines a good shepherd? What can help us to define what a good shepherd is? Well, Jesus himself tells us what a good shepherd is. Now, there are other things, and we're not going to go into a lot of details here about other things that a good shepherd would do. But this is what is a good shepherd. Innately, what is a good shepherd? And this is what a good shepherd is and how we can see who he is. He lays down his life for the sheep. Now, it would have been a very rare thing for the shepherd, any shepherd, to give his life for the sheep. If a thief or a robber broke in through the gate or a wolf or another animal attacked the sheep, the shepherd was under no obligation or even delusions that he had to give his life for the sheep. No one would do that. If the wolf came in and, well, it's so, it's, he didn't want it to happen, but the wolf took a few of the she his sheep, but he's, he wants to be safe, so he doesn't give his life for the sheep. So right away, we see that what defines a good shepherd is different for the people that were listening and for uh, what Jesus was describing. In verse 18 in that chapter, he gives more information to the listening Pharisees. He says that he lays down his life for the sheep, but he does it in, on his own accord. He's also, he said earlier, he gives his life for the sheep, he lays down, but now he's saying, I'm doing it because I want to do this. No one takes it from me. He says, no one's going to grab it. No enemy is going to overpower me. Um, he doesn't lose interest in life and just passively lay down and die from disinterest in living. Jesus says very clearly, I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to pick it up again. Um, talking about speaking on authority, Matthew 26, 50, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, remember Judas came with a kiss, gave him a kiss, and uh, that was the sign that they were to arrest Jesus. And Simon Peter was there, and he took his sword, and he cut off the right ear 
I love all these details in the Bible, right ear of the high priest servant. And uh, his name was Malchus. We know that too. Uh, and Jesus said this, put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And listen to this. Do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus had the authority to lay his life down. Even before he was be when he was before Pilate, and Pilate said, gave, he said, where do you come from? And Jesus wouldn't give him any answers. And Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate's pretty full of himself and who he is. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you have realize that I have the power, Pilate said to Jesus, either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered. He said, you would have no power on, over me if it were not given to you from above. So we need to remember that this is an important distinction. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. He did it because of his love for us, and he had the power to do it, and as we know, the power to pick it up again. You know, just a few moments ago, we participated in the service of communion where we were reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus, who himself, he himself became that sacrificial lamb, laying down his life for his flock. And not only does our good shepherd know who belongs to him, but we just as he knows us, we know him. We recognize his voice. Verses 3 and 4 and verse 27 and 8 tell us, My sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. You know, it's, I was thinking this, this week about how when we were raising our family, we have three children, and one of the signs that they had to kind of, one of the things that we would do in our family, um, if the kids were far away from us, we live on a street where there's a park. So if our children were up playing in the park and we wanted to get them to come home for supper or something like that, then Charlie would whistle. My husband would whistle for them. And he has a distinctive whistle. It's very loud and for me very annoying, but it's very effective because the kids hear that whistle and they'd come running. And if they heard the whistle and didn't come running, then there'd be, there'd be a little you know, price to pay for that. Well, it worked fine for the kids. And I think Charlie thought it would be, it was really good for the kids, so he would kind of try it with me. And it didn't go over so well. I wasn't at the park, I was in the mall. And I was uh, doing my, I was in that my happy place, shopping around, and um, Charlie was getting a little frustrated because he couldn't find me, and he looked everywhere, and it seemed like we just kept missing each other. So finally, he just whistled. <laughs> It wasn't a good moment. It wasn't a good moment. <laughs> so we have an agreement now. He doesn't whistle for me. He can call on the phone, but no whistling. <laughs> Secondly, the bad. Verse 12, 12 tells us the characteristics of a bad shepherd. The bad shepherd abandons his flock and lets them scatter when the wolves come in. You know, yes, shepherds watch their flocks by night, but so do the wolves. For the desert, the desert is both... Uh, a home for the pack and a home for the flock. The Jewish people knew all about bad shepherds, for they, they were, many of them were that were sitting right there listening to Jesus talk. Many of them were they. They were the ones that were teaching, um, deviating from the law, putting uh, pressure on the people to do certain things that were the Pharisaical laws, not the Mosaic laws. And they were just more, it seemed like the Pharisees were more interested in feeding and caring for themselves than for the people of God. Well, we look at this parable and we think, oh, well, that's just back in Palestine, first century Jews, that was their problem. But there, a parable has a meaning, and it not only had a meaning for the people then, it has one for us. For we know that in this parable, the flock is the church of Christ. And it suffers, we're learning here, that it can suffer from double danger, one from the threats outside the church and the other from within. And it's the job of the shepherd to recognize and hinder the attacks that will come from the wolf, to keep up a constant vigil to, of watchfulness and security. And if he or she neglects the shop, the flock, then to, that they would leave them vulnerable. Most often, uh, biblical writers will use the, the designation wolves to describe those predators who would destroy the community of faith from within. False teachers. People that get us off track and get us away from what the Bible is and what it teaches. False prophets. 
those who take advantage of those who are weak and are learning in their faith. So we are to be careful, and there we are warned through Scripture. Um, when the Apostle Paul, in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 20, when he was leaving Eph Ephesus, getting ready to leave there, he told them, um, "Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought his, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and not spare the flock." Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. And so we too need to be on our guard against false teachings and things that teach us, take us away from the gospel. We have all heard of churches that have covered up sins of leadership and uh, have hindered the work of Christ. We become sometimes in those situations preoccupied with saving face instead of the saving grace that God extends to everyone who has messed up royally. We confront the sin and we ask for forgiveness. You know, when King David, he tried to cover up his sins with Bathsheba. Remember, he had, um, he had a, an affair with her. He had her husband killed when he found out that she was pregnant. And what am I supposed to do? Her husband was at war, and she was pregnant by David. So he tried to cover it up and then kind of looked like the hero in the story by marrying the Uriah's pregnant widow. But uh, he wrote, he was confronted with his sin. Nathan the prophet, you can read all about it, came and confronted with him with a sin, and he said, I have sinned. And he wrote a couple of psalms, Psalm 51, um, Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I was si kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. There's a funny story about uh, Frederick the Great. He, great, he was the king of Prussia. He went to inspect the Berlin prison, and as he was walking through the masses of shackled men, they fell to his feet, pleading their innocence and that they were models of upright living and they shouldn't be in this wallowing away in this prison. They claimed to be falsely accused and completely blameless of any wrongdoing, and all, the, all of them were citing their in innocence except one man. So Frederick called out to him, he said, prisoner, why are you here? The man responded, I robbed a man, your majesty. King Frederick then asked him, well, are you guilty? And he said, yes, I am, your majesty. Then Frederick called over a guard and said to him, release this man immediately. I will not have this scoundrel thief here where he might corrupt all of these other fine, virtuous, and innocent men. Confession. Mark said, uh, Mark Buchanan in his book, Your God is Too Safe, wrote this about confession. Confession is ground clearing, getting the garbage and debris out of the way so that we can build something there. It has zero value unless you get, actually get on with the building. Confess, yes, but move forward and walk in obedience, in the light, in the way that God has for us. Thirdly, the ugly. And I know you're just sitting on the edge of your seat. What is she going to use for ugly here? <laughs> Charlie got a new haircut. <laughs> You're cute. You're cute. Um, my, I, what I have here is exclusiveness. Think about it. Exclusiveness. It has been said that one of the hardest things in the world to unlearn is exclusiveness. Once a person or a group of people get into their heads that they are better than any, another group of people, that they are actually privileged, specially privileged, it's often difficult for them to believe that, they, that the same privileges that they enjoy are open to everyone. Jewish people are a perfect example of this. They thought, because they were God's chosen people, that that meant that God had no use for any other nations. It was just them. And everyone else in the world, God wasn't interested in. But Jesus said in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too will hear my voice, and there shall be, love this, one flock, one shepherd. I'm sorry that we can't all meet together today, but we are 
even though we're meeting at different times today, or are there some at home that can't meet with us? We are one flock, and we follow one shepherd. Um, we have to, God had given Israel to be a light for the nations. They were to be a light, the ones that would show the way so other people could come to know Christ. Isaiah 42, 49, you can look it up. But the Jews had conveniently forgotten that. You know, um, when Jesus a little later walked through the, the streets of Jerusalem while the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Just after that, he walked into the temple courts. And here they are in the setup with all of their, the money changers. The people had their tables set up, all the animals, in the court of the Gentiles. And here they are selling. And Jesus said, uh, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? For all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. You know, exclusiveness isn't just a problem for the people of Jesus' day. For we know that we are dealing with that very same challenge in the world. You know, actually, actually, exclusiveness might be too nice of a way to put it. For you know, if we watch the news, if we know we see these disturbing pictures day after day that display how people treat one another uh, because they think they're more deserving because of their color of their skin, their level of education, um, their social standing, the prejudice and hatred that walks our streets all around the globe is disturbing. We need to be thankful that we are at least 150 years away from when slavery was allowed in our country, actually closer to 175 in Canada and 150 in the US. Slavery, a blight on the people of our countries. Abraham Lincoln wrote regarding the oppression of people. He said this, although volume upon volume is, uh, is written to prove slavery is a good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. You know, prejudice is something that we see and we do have to look at that and see it for what it is. I've been reading a book, it's called Half the Sky, from a Chinese proverb that says that women hold up half the sky. Uh, it's not a Christian book, it's written by a couple of, um, a husband and wife team, that New York journalist, and they were actually at, I think it was 1989, I think, uh, Tiananmen Square, the day all of those revolts were happening. Anyway, they wrote this book about um, prejudice and about uh, oppression, the violation of rights against women, about slaver, slavery, about gender, in, in, gender inequality. And it's unsettling, unsettling to say the least, but it is probably one of the more important books that I've read because I'm reminded that we all have, we all can make a difference. We can all uh, speak up and say, and uh, speak up and go against what some people think is good, gender um just racial prejudice, all of these things, we see this so much and we need to speak up. And I just pray that we can be reminded that we're all created, all of us created in the image of God, everyone. No one person, no more perfect than the other. And I pray that God will help us to show the love of Christ to all people. So as I close this morning, I want to remind you that Jesus, yes, is our good shepherd. And that good shepherd became our sacrificial lamb, willingly giving his life for us. For you see all along, the good shepherd was the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Romans 8, 5, 8 says this, God shows, us his, shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isaiah wrote prophetically about the Messiah. He said, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God is with us. We can celebrate that fact. The good shepherd is with us. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward, and we're going to sing 
a song in closing, above all. He's above all powers, above all kings, above all nature, above all created things. Jesus is the one who is above all, and yet he thought of you and me to give his life for us, to give us all. Let's stand. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were there before the world began. It's above all kingdoms, above all for thinking of each one of us you died for our sin and we are so grateful we are eternally grateful and thank you Lord that we have an example in you thank you God I pray you'd be with us as your people that you would go with us that you would strengthen us you would protect us and help us Lord to continue to listen to your voice listen Lord help us to be obedient to what you call us to do so be with us as we go, and we praise the name of our Lord. And we pray in the name of, your, of Jesus. Amen. I'm just going to ask you to go out one section at a time. Thank you. <laughs>